vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? A generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it rises. The wind blows to the south and goes round to the east. And on its circuits the wind returns. All streams run to the sea, but the sea is not full. To the place where the streams flow, there they flow again. All things are full of weariness. A man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. What has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done. And there is nothing new under the sun. Is there a thing of which it said, see, this is new? It's been already in the ages before us. There is no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of later things yet to be among those who come after. Thank you very much, Alistair, and uh, thank you to all of you for coming. It's lovely to see you this morning. Um, I'm not sure about the introduction of this being, uh, you, there's the book and this is the film of this morning. Mo most people end up saying the book is better than the film, don't they? So um, I don't know what that means you're in for, uh, for these, these four mornings. Um, we're, going, we're going to look at the book of Ecclesiastes over four sessions and the book of Ecclesiastes in the light of the whole Bible and the gospel of the Lord Jesus. What does this book have to say to us and what, what kind of sense can we make of it? Here, here's where we're going to go. I'm sorry that the we have a backlit screen in the middle of a heat wave. Um, so we're going to try and move the screen for tomorrow morning over to this side. So if you can't see too well today, I think by tomorrow morning things will be much better uh, on this side. What I'm going to try and do is give you four lenses for reading the book of Ecclesiastes. So we're going to look at some passages, some passages in detail. But I want to leave you with this big picture, uh, four, four ways of making sense of Ecclesiastes perspectives, what we're going to look at this morning, then tomorrow morning we're going to think about time in the book of Ecclesiastes, then on Thursday morning, and no seminar Wednesday morning, Thursday morning we come to death and we finish on Friday morning, send you on your way rejoicing after all the misery uh, with life at the end. Um, but I want to begin, I want to begin with, oh I've gone too far, I want to begin with a story for you this morning. Once upon a time there was a kingdom in a faraway land that was ruled by a wonderful king called King Lothar. And King Lothar was happily married to Queen Emma. And all the subjects of the kingdom loved both their king and their queen. And the subjects of the kingdom were delighted when three sons were given to the king and the queen, three boys that they had together, Alexander, Julius, and Joseph. And as the three boys grew up, it was evident that all three were very different from each other. Alexander was a handsome man. And occasionally it was known that Alexander would creep into the throne room and put his father's crown on his head and often sit on the throne wondering what kind of king he would be. Julius, the second son, was a strong and brave young man. If there were wars to be fought in the kingdom, he was first over the top in the wars of the kingdom. And the third boy was Joseph. Joseph was a shepherd boy, and not particularly handsome to look at, not particularly strong or brave or courageous. He loved to tend the animals in the kingdom. But of course, as happens in all kingdoms, the king gets old, comes to the end of his reign. Which son should succeed King Lothar as king? And so uh, King Lothar and his advisors, they gathered around trying to work out what to do. It wasn't automatic that the eldest would become king. Instead, they decided to set a contest to see who could gain the crown. What he did was he got the whole kingdom together. He got his three sons there at the front, uh, ga gathered in the courtyard, and he said, I'm going to send you off on a mission to the far ends of the earth, and I want each of you, my boys, my sons, to return to me with a creature most fit for a king. And the son who brings back a creature most fit for a king 
will have the crown of the kingdom. So all the people thought this was a wonderful idea. What, what, what are the three boys going to bring back? The three boys went out to the ends of the earth. The first son to come back six months later was Alexander, the eldest, the handsome son. Alexander arrived with all his courtiers behind him, and he was carrying a golden, a golden crate into the courtyard covered in a golden cloth. And everybody gathered round, and to everybody's amazement, as Alexander pulled off the cloth, what was inside the crate, the cage? Any guesses? A lion, an eagle? No. Third time lucky? Sorry? A wife? No. 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 A, a peacock. And a, uh, Alexander opened the cage, the peacock came out, fanned his tail, the, the crowd oohed and aahed, and women fainted. This was astonishing. They'd never seen anything so beautiful. Uh, Alexander's choice of a creature fit for a king. They waited six months longer, and Julius returned, the strong, brave, courageous son, this time carrying a larger crate, also covered in a golden cloth. He pulled off the, the cloth to reveal... A lion. Okay, well done. Yeah, you're getting into the swing of it now. And he opened the door of the, the crate. The lion came out. The lion ate the peacock. Um, more people fainted. And everybody said, surely, of course, this is a creature fit for a king. What could be better than a lion to symbolize a king and a kingdom? Joseph will surely be king. No, said Lothar, we must wait. Uh, Julius must surely be king. No, he said, we must wait for Joseph to return. They waited another few months, and this time Joseph returned, not carrying a crate, not carrying a cage, nothing covered in a golden cloth, but Joseph walked into the courtyard, leading the creature that he had chosen to be most fit for a king. What did Joseph bring with him? A, a lamb? A donkey? Elephant? I, I, ha I have to tell you, we have actually already had the right answer given at the wrong time. A wife, that's right, that's right. Joseph brought with him Sophia, the shepherd girl who lived over the hill. And Joseph said to his parents, to all the people gathered, he said, I haven't traveled to the far ends of the earth. Simply rather, in the time that I have lived in my kingdom, I have grown to know this young woman from the neighboring village. And Sophia is kind, she is generous, she is courageous, she is upright. She is beautiful, and she will be my wife. Now, many of you know, of course, that Sophia, the Greek word for wisdom, and this story has been told for centuries to illustrate a really amazing biblical truth, which is that in, in the Bible, wisdom is a woman. You know that in the book of Proverbs? As you read Proverbs all the way through, that the personification of wisdom is female. So here's... Proverbs chapter 4, verse 7, if you can see that uh, on the screen. The beginning of wisdom is this, get wisdom, and whatever you get, get insight. Prize her highly, and she will exalt you. She will honor you if you embrace her. She will place on your head a graceful garland. She will bestow on you a beautiful crown. It's interesting, isn't it, that it's female, it's not just it, but it's her, it's, it's she. And, and there, there's lots of things happening with that about wisdom being portrayed as a woman, but one of the things, one of the simple things that's happening with wisdom being portrayed in this way is that the Bible's wisdom literature says to us that wisdom is something outside you. Wisdom is not something that you're born with, it's not innate, it's not built into you. Wisdom is something external to you that you need to come into relationship with and that you need to find. I think it's the Bible's way of saying that wisdom means you need to get to know someone rather than simply something. And of course, we know, don't we, is that as the whole Bible unfolds, the way that this takes full personal shape is that the Lord Jesus himself is described as the wisdom from God, isn't he? One greater than Solomon. 
So the fact that wisdom is like this is the Bible's way of saying wisdom is external to you. Nobody is born wise. Wisdom comes uh, through, th through living in relationship to somebody. Now, here, here's, here's a lovely quote from Derek Kidner. This is on his, uh, his commentary on Proverbs. And this is something that will just help us as we come to try and set Ecclesiastes in the context of the wisdom literature of the Bible. Uh, here's what Kidner says about the Bible's wisdom literature. That there are details of character, okay, char your character, my character, parts of who we are, that are small enough to escape the mesh of the law and the broadsides of the prophets. Okay, so, th so think about the law. There's, what, what is it? Something like 613 commandments in the Old Testament altogether, or in, in Jewish tradition at least. 613 commandments. That, that's a lot of life covered, isn't it? Do this, don't do that. Okay, so you've got the law in the Bible, and then you have the prophets who just keep coming back to the people, and the prophets aren't really preaching anything new ever, are they? They're just saying to, the, to God's people, you've forgotten the law. Go back to the law. Remember what God told you to do. And Derek Kidner says, if you put the mesh of the law and the broadsides of the prophets, if you put them on top of each other to make an even bigger mesh, okay, there are, thing, there are parts of life that still fall through the gaps. That there are still parts of life that even the 613 commandments and what the prophets say to the people don't cover everything in life. So there, there, there are these small details that slip through the net, yet which are decisive in personal dealings. Isn't that amazing? 613 commandments, all the law and the prophets, and yet some of the most significant parts of life are not covered. That's why we have the wisdom literature. Because the wisdom literature asks, what is a person like to live with? What is he like to employ? How does he or she manage their affairs, his time, herself? That's what the wisdom literature says to us. And Ecclesiastes adds, okay, if you're taking notes, this is the bit to write, to write down. In addition to this, what is he like to die with? How will he die? And how does this person live in light of his death? That's what Ecclesiastes adds in the mix of the whole wisdom literature. Not just what are they like to employ, not just what are they like with his time. Has this person's death affected them while they are still alive? Okay, so we're going to think about death, not just in one session, but we're going to think about death over four, uh, four sessions. And it might sound depressing, but I do want to ask you to hold on at very least until Friday morning. Okay, the, if, if you don't feel like there's any good news all through the week, it, it is there on Friday. I hope you're not going to feel like that, but it will come very strongly, I hope, uh, on Friday morning. But until we get there, until all the pieces of the puzzle come together, here's something else that we need to know about wisdom literature. This is from Tony Thistledon, a professor at Nottingham University. He said this in an article, wisdom literature wounds from behind. In other words, it, it's an unexpected punch when you're not expecting it. You know that sort of happens, you, out of the blue you get winded and you're left sort of standing, gasping, gasping for breath. Wisdom literature, all of it, all of it does that. So um, if you have a Bible, just, just look at Proverbs chapter 27. Proverbs chapter 27 verse 15. Uh, you may know this famous proverb, uh, a continual dripping on a rainy day and a quarrelsome wife are alike. Okay, and we all smile, don't we? we? We all imagine, you know, how awful that would be. We, we get the, the point of the picture. But if you actually think about it, some of you, you're not going to have it this week, are you camping? But some of you camping in the pouring rain, and there's something outside your tent, and all night long you just hear that dripping noise. Drip, 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 drip. You're lying there trying to get to sleep, or you're in your house and you've got a leaking tap and it's just dripping over and over and over again. Repetitive noise is what military units use for torture, isn't it? 
whatever type of noise it is, just playing the same sound over and over and over again. Wisdom literature is wounding us from behind. Wisdom literature here is saying, friends, it is possible to make your marriage a torture chamber. It's possible to be in the type of marriage that is like being tortured. So obviously the, the, the point of the proverb is don't do that. Don't, don't, don't be like that. And you get this kind of punch in the gut all the time from, uh, from the way that the wisdom literature works. It leaves you winded. And then here's what I want to say. And I hope you see this over the, the four sessions. It leaves you ca- trying to catch your breath. And then it leaves you grateful for the punch. It, it leaves you grateful for the wound that you've had unexpectedly from behind. Because now that you've had that wound, you, you look at the world in an entirely different way. It, it just begins to make sense in a new way. So what, what I think Ecclesiastes does is that it, it's trying to change our, our, our perspective on death. That, that, that's the message of the book. And what I think Ecclesiastes does is it says that there is a third way to look at something where we usually only think there are two ways. Okay? There's a third way to think about death when really in the Bible and in our Christian thinking, we've become used to thinking there are only two ways of thinking about death. And so you see this all the time, don't you? Here, 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 here's something where we think there are only two ways to look at a glass that's got half the amount of water in it. Some people see a glass half empty. Others see the glass half full, and we think those are the only two options for looking at the glass. Can you, can you, can you see a third option? It's not, it's, sorry? Well, it is a glass of water, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Look at that, look at that. That's right. This is a man called George Carlin, I think. He said, I see a glass. Some people see a glass half empty. Some people see a glass half full. I see a glass twice the size that it needs to be. There, there, is a, there is a third way of looking at something that we often think there are only two ways of looking at. And I think the book of Ecclesiastes is like that with death. What, what are the two ways we normally think about death in, in the Bible? On the one hand, we say death is a curse. That's clear, isn't it, from Genesis? God has placed death in the world as a limit on fallen creatures trying to usurp the creator. This is, this is the God's punishment on rebellious creatures. We also know from the New Testament, Paul in Philippians, death can be a blessing. It's a blessing to depart and to be with Christ. Which is better to carry on in the body or to be with Christ? Paul says to be with Christ would be better, wouldn't it? And we think those are the only two ways that the Bible speaks about death. Death, a terrible curse that robs us, that breaks our hearts, a blessing while we go to be with Jesus. And Ecclesiastes says, no, there is actually a third way to look at death. And and I think it's this, that death can teach you how to live. Death can teach you how to live. So later on in the week, I'm going to try and argue that death is a surgeon in Ecclesiastes, death is a preacher in Ecclesiastes, and death is an artist in Ecclesiastes. Death can teach you how to live. That's the surprising third angle on death in this book. Here's a collect, the fourth Sunday after Trinity. Uh, When this was written, I think uh, this is written to summarize the message of Ecclesiastes in a beautiful prayer. God, the protector of all that trust in thee, without whom nothing is strong, nothing is holy, increase and multiply upon us thy mercy, that thou, being our ruler and guide, we may so pass through things temporal, that we finally lose not the things eternal. Grant this, Heavenly Father, for Jesus Christ's sake, our Lord. Amen. Do you see those those two lines, four up from the bottom? A prayer that we may so pass through things temporal that we finally lose not the things eternal. That is the book of Ecclesiastes in a nutshell. How do you move through this life with all its, all its ugliness and evil and sadness and brokenness and all its beauty and goodness and happiness and glory? 
How do you move through life where both of those things kind of just come at you, sometimes out of the blue, unexpectedly, they're, they're woven together in one thread? How do you move through those things while not losing things eternal with, with your eye on what is coming? That, that's what Ecclesiastes is wrestling with and trying to, trying to help us get our heads around. So th- th- this whole idea about perspective, um, he, he, here's a famous, a famous sermon from C.S. Lewis. Uh, C.S. Lewis preached this sermon uh, on the eve, uh, the, the advent of the Second World War. It's a famous sermon called Learning in Wartime. And this sermon was C.S. Lewis's own personal profound wrestling with the relationship between temporal things and eternal things. Uh, and the context, of course, was C.S. Lewis with his students trying to help them make sense of academic pleasures Uh, what what C.S. Lewis called placid occupations. How can they be be at study while Europe is poised to be at war? Okay, so while Europe was on the precipice of such a great conflict, how can you possibly go off to Oxford or Cambridge or wherever it is and study? What C.S. Lewis did, he said, the answer to that question is, instead of looking at the Second World War right over the, in our immediate, immediate window, you simply need to widen the lens to look at the whole story of the universe. What he did was he, he, he broadened the scope from the immediate danger of war to the more remote but greatest reality of all, the judgment that is coming. So C.S. Lewis said, if learning in wartime may be compared to Nero fiddling while Rome burned, then to a Christian, the true tragedy of Nero must not be that he fiddled while the city was on fire, but that he fiddled on the brink of hell. In other words, C.S. Lewis said, the real question is this, how should we make sense of anything at all in our bodily, earthly, present lives while the yawning chasm of eternity is waiting for us all on the other side of the grave? I think many of us wrestled with that during COVID, didn't we? All of a sudden, the world was faced with death. And I think it was one of the strongest things Christian people had to say is that all all this is, is a reminder to all of us of what is coming to all. That's exactly what C.S. Lewis is doing here. I I think when you widen the lens, it changes everything. It's not that our questions or our challenges disappear. Rather, when you widen the lens, our questions come into sharper focus, don't they? So what I I want to try and do is to, to show you now, I want to try and give you a couple of a couple of helps uh, on Ecclesiastes. I want to give you four keys to Ecclesiastes, and then I want to give you four Ps. You've got to have Ps, haven't you, somewhere in a sermon or seminar. Four keys, and then four Ps. And I hope you're going to be able to read this, at at least the big words on the screen. If you can't get the smaller words, don't worry, I'll um, I'll, I'll explain them as we go through. I want to take this wide-angle lens. I want, I want us to think about Ecclesiastes as a unified book, first of all. And then we're going to narrow a little bit and think about a question that Ecclesiastes asks. Then we're going to think about a phrase that Ecclesiastes uses. And then we're going to think about a key word in Ecclesiastes. So you see the sort of wide-angle narrowing down uh, the whole book, uh, a start question, a key phrase, um, and a vital word. Now, I, I think this, this, this is the slightly more technical bit if, you're, um, if you want to switch off for a bit. Uh, this is the bit to do that in. Um, but I, I, hopefully this will make sense. It's quite an important thing about the book. It, Alistair read for us the prologue that comes at the start of the book. And there is an epilogue as well that comes at the end of the book. So Ecclesiastes chapter 12, and you've got 9 to 14. And one of the things that has happened here in scholarship is that some scholars notice that the prologue and the epilogue are both written in the third person, okay? So in in my version, the ESV, the words of the preacher, the son of David, vanity of vanity, says the preacher, okay? And you get the third person again at the end of the book from verse 9, besides being wise, the preacher also taught the people knowledge. But if you look at chapter 1, verse 12, at the end of the prologue, it moves to the first person, I, the preacher, have been king over Israel in Jerusalem. And it runs like that in the first person all the way through until the epilogue begins at the end. Okay? 
So, some commentators, Tremper Longman and his commentary, uh, the Nicot series, New International Commentary in the Old Testament, this is a, a clear example of this. So, I'm going to pick on him uh, for a moment. Uh, he's not the only one who's done this, but he's quite an influential one, at least in many of our circles. Tremper Longman says, prologue and epilogue, third person, chapter 1, verse 12, it is autobiography all the way through to the end. And, says Tremper Longman, the prologue and the epilogue are speaking a different message than the autobiography in the middle. Okay? The autobiog autobiographical section, which is the main section, here's what Tremper Longman says. It contains stark observations about God, life, and death, okay, that are in explicit conflict with the wisdom traditions of Israel. So much so that the teacher's God, and th these are Tremper Longman's exact words, the teacher's God, okay, so from chapter 1, verse 12, through to chapter 12, verse 8, the God that you meet in that part of the book is distant, occasionally indifferent, and sometimes cruel. Okay, now, maybe you resonate with that. I think many of us do. If you read that middle section of the book, there are some incredibly hard things to understand in there. But, says Tremper Long, when that unorthodox perspective in the middle part of the book is countered and corrected by the epilogue and the prologue, particularly the epilogue at the end. And Tremper Longman says those two bits form a kind of frame around the book that shapes how we should read the whole book. It's as if somebody has come along, looked at this stuff and said, there's some pretty hairy stuff in there. I think we need to try and fix this a little bit and you know, stuck something on the start and the end. It was Alec Mateer, wasn't it, who used to say that why do biblical commentators think that the world is populated by manic editors? Um, and th 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 that's an example of it, that th these two bits tacked on the end are, are correcting and redeeming the autobiographical section. Now, I want to say, Tremper Longman's view, and any other commentators who take that view, that shouldn't be too quickly dismissed, okay? As soon as you hear the word unorthodox, um, you know, you hear him saying there, there's unorthodox stuff about God. Immediately, your alarm bells go off. But the Bible does contain unorthodox statements, doesn't it? You only, you only need to read the book of Job to see that large parts of Scripture are people saying untrue things about God, or at least in the book of Job, Job's comforters. And that, that's an example that Longman himself uses in support of his position. Okay? So that, that kind of view arises from trying to take really seriously the bleakness of the book and wrestling with it, okay? But let me give you some problems with that, that way of reading the book. If you look at chapter 1, verses 1 to 11, okay, that prologue is really quite awkward if you're trying to say that this is positive and this is orthodox while the middle bit of the book is unorthodox. Although chapter 1, verses 1 to 11 is poetically beautiful, and it is, isn't it? The sun rises, the sun goes down, hastens to the place where it rises, the wind blows to the south, round and round, okay? Verses 1 to 11 are as depressing as anything else in the rest of the book, aren't they? Beautiful poetry to maybe, maybe slip in through the back door and wound from behind the fact that when you have died a hundred years later, nobody will know you were ever here. Okay, that's what chapter 1 verses 1 to 11 are saying. Okay. It, it's not straightforward to say that 1, 1 to 11 is a positive take on the whole book. And the same happens with the epilogue. If you look at the epilogue, chapter uh, 12, verse 9, Tremper Longman has to give a different translation of it and a different interpretation of it because at first blush, at first reading, the epilogue's description of the autobiographical section is positive, isn't it? It's not negative. Besides being wise, the teacher also taught the people knowledge, weighing and studying and arranging many proverbs with great care. The preacher sought to find words of delight and uprightly he wrote words of truth. So Longman has to reinterpret that in some way to say that, that it, it, it's not what it looks like, when actually at face value, this person, whoever it is at the end, says that what you've just read is delightful and truthful. So that, 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 
those are two initial reasons why we need to be careful with what Tremper Longman has said. But here's the main flaw, I think. I think this is the decisive one for me. Okay? Tremper Longman recognizes that in that middle bit, the autobiographical section, there are also many positive passages that appear alongside all the bleak passages. So it's not just that the prologue and the, the epilogue in particular correct the middle bit. He has a big problem because in the middle of the book, there are lots of positives. Look at chapter 2, verse 24. So if you look at verse 3, there, there, or verse 22, there's all the negative. What is a man from all the toil and striving of heart with which he toils beneath the sun? For all his days are full of sorrow and his work is a vexation. Even in the night his heart does not rest. This also is meaningless or vanity. But here's the positive. There is nothing better for a person that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. This also I saw is from the hand of God. Look at chapter 3 verse 12. I perceive that there is nothing better for them than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live. That everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his toil. This is God's gift to man. Chapter 5, verses 18 to 20. Chapter 8, 15. And chapter 9, verse 7 to 10 that we're going to come to, particularly in the last morning. So, Tremper Longman says, Autobi Autobiography section, unorthodox, God is cruel, distant, indifferent. Hang on. There are also these positive passages that say, these things also are a gift from God. What do I do with that? And here's Tremper Longman's answer. And I think this is, this goes to the heart of misunderstanding Ecclesiastes. Tremper Longman looks at all those passages. So if you, if you look at them again, chapter 2. Okay, look at chapter 2, verse 24. There is nothing better for a person than, than that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. Tremper Longman looks at that and says, ah, yes, I know it looks positive, but that is only a limited type of joy. Okay, that's his phrase, a limited type of joy, because those things are connected to eating, drinking, and work. Now, I think at that point, okay, what you're seeing is a reading of the Bible that has not penetrated deeply enough to the idolatry of the human heart to take eating drinking working and when you get to chapter 9 you have relating as well enjoy your life with your wife the wife of your youth let's put those four things together eating drinking working relating to take those four things and for God's people to say those are only a limited type of joy I think is idolatrous. For what did God give Adam and Eve in the garden? Relationship. What did he tell them to do? To eat, to drink, and to work. What was the original creation mandate? Fill the earth, be fruitful, multiply, eat, drink, work. What Tremper Longman calls limited types of joy, I want to say the Bible says are the only joys. And that's probably too strong. I've probably gone too far the other way there to say the only joys. That they are they are creaturely joys. They are what God intends for his people. In the garden, in relationship to him and in relationship to each other. What Tremper Longman says is only limited. God, in fact, says is everything there is. Okay? So I think that is part of the message of Ecclesiastes. Go back to the beginning, to what God gave Adam and Eve to do. And if you simply accept that that, that is what God has given you to do, rather than wanting extra and more for yourself, you will find happiness. You will find contentment. You will, you will discover afresh what God intended creatures to be like in his world. So th th there's a really amazing uh, quote from Derek Kidner. I'm going to come to it. Uh, where, have I, where have I written it down? Here it is. I'm going to come to it at some point later on in the week. I can't remember where it is. I'll, I'll put, I'll, you'll, you'll see it on the screen later in the week at some point. Somewhere uh, in Derek Kidner's Sam's commentaries, he's got 
uh, Tyndale Old Testament commentary. So it's somewhere in the first volume. I've never been able to track it down after reading it. Um, so it's not, on, it's not on Ecclesiastes, not on Proverbs. But on his Sam's commentary, he says this. This was the nerve the serpent touched in Eden to make paradise, even paradise, seem an insult. This was the nerve the serpent touched in Eden to make paradise seem an insult. That is, I think, hands down my favorite, most favorite quote ever from a biblical scholar. He, he's seen, hasn't he, that what the serpent managed to do was enter the garden where God placed Adam and Eve and, and, and said to them, didn't he, be fruitful, like go at it, work, cultivate, cultivate the earth, push the boundaries of the garden back. Only Eden was the garden. The rest of the world was wild and untamed. Push the boundaries of the garden back. Have children multiply, get, get multiple gardeners and eat and drink. There's only one tree you mustn't eat from, but look at everything else you've got to eat and drink from. And the serpent entered the garden and managed to get Adam and Eve to say to God, is this it? Is this, it? Is this all you've given us? He managed to make paradise seem an insult. And the human creature, the human creature rose above its station, wanted to be God, to replace God, to take the place of God. So it's, so it's a profoundly mistaken thing, I think, to say that eating and drinking and working are limited types of joy. Now, of course, there is more to them for us as Christian people. The, the, creation, the creation mandate given to Adam and Eve now gets given again to Abraham, doesn't it? This time given to Abraham as a gift. I will bless you. I will make you, fru I will make you fruitful. But it doesn't change the fact that in this world, we are still human beings who have jobs, who have relationships, who have bodily needs to eat and drink uh, all through our life. And Ecclesiastes is a profound meditation on what it means to be truly human. And you will know and I will know there is a difference between eating and drinking and working and relating and being happy with those things as good gifts in themselves. There's a difference between that and taking all of those things and using them to fuel our own ambitious projects, usually at the detriment of the people that we're in relationship to. So Ecclesiastes meditates, chapter 4, meditates very long and hard on the man who takes God's good gifts of work, food, drink, and uses them all to make himself the richest man in the world. And he sits alone in the restaurant at night. Nobody eats and drinks with him. All of it is a reversal of the creation story. And Ecclesiastes is bringing us back to say we need to think about this we need to think about this again. So that's Ecclesiastes as a unified book. Whatever else you do with it, friends, uh, even if you disagree with this whole approach, treat it as one, one big book, uh, please, from beginning to end. Second thing, not just a unified book, Ecclesiastes asks a stark question. And the stark question, I'm not going to say too much about this because I'm going to try and explain this tomorrow and later on. The stark question is there in chapter 1, verse 3. What does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? I think the whole of Ecclesiastes is trying to give a biblical answer to that question. What does a man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? The rest of the book is an answer to that question. And the answer is not much. Not much. And the genius of the book is getting you to be happy with that answer doesn't sound particularly attractive, does it? And yet, reaching a place of contentment with that answer is the aim of this book. Okay, a, start, a unified book, a start question, a key phrase. I think these next two are quite important for us. There's a phrase in Ecclesiastes we need to get right, under the sun, that's there in that uh, question in verse three. And there's a particular word we need to get right, the meaning of vanity or, or meaninglessness. 
I think over the years, many, many people have gone wrong with Ecclesiastes by reading this phrase, under the sun, in a wrong way. When we hear the phrase, under the sun, okay, I think we tend to split the world spatially, don't we? That, that's what it looks like, under, under, and you think there's going to be an above the sun. So we often take the meaning to be that under the sun, things are a certain way, but above the sun, it's different. Okay, so under the sun is the world's way, the, the empty way. It's, it's life lived without God and without the Lord Jesus. But above the sun, if you are in relationship to God and in relationship to Christ, above the sun, everything is different. Okay? Now, I think that way of reading Ecclesiastes can actually end up linked to a very wooden Christology. It, it, it can be the kind of the kind of way of reading Ecclesiastes that, Ecclesiastes that says, look, life without Jesus is awful, but come to Jesus and life will be wonderful. Your life under the sun is a mess and meaningless, but above the sun in relationship to God, life will be uh, so much different. Now, I think that's to misread that key phrase. Rather than thinking spatially above and below, under the sun helps us to think chronologically, okay? In the ancient world and in, in scripture, the sun marked time more than it marked space. The sun marked time more than it marked space. The phrase, here's another commentator, the phrase under the sun refers to a, a now. It refers to today, to these days, rather than a there, to those days. Under the sun is a way of saying, in, as long as the earth lasts, in this period of time, this is just how things are. Okay? What does a man gain by all the toil at which he toils in, in this passing life? In the, the three score years and ten that he or she might be graciously given by God, what do you gain? It's very different from saying, what does a man gain by all the toil at which he toils without the Lord Jesus? And then with him, all of a sudden, everything is different. Now, please don't mishear me. Of course, things are different related to Christ. We're going to come to that as well in what we look at. But Ecclesiastes is saying, this is just how things are under the sun until Christ comes back again. One little pointer here to, the, I think, the way that we need to read Ecclesiastes well in relationship to the Lord Jesus. Mark chapter 7, do you remember the story that uh, Jesus is healing a man, um, I think the ESV says, uh, with a speech impediment, Mark chapter 7, uh, verse 31. Then Jesus returned from the region of Tyre and went through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. They brought to him a man who was deaf and had a speech impediment, and they begged Jesus to lay his hand on him. And taking him aside from the crowd, privately he put his fingers into his ears, and after splitting, touched his tongue, and looking up to heaven, and here's the bit we just pass over, he sighed and said to the man, Ephatha, that is, be opened. Look at, look at Mark chapter 8, verse 12. This is Jesus with the Pharisees. The Pharisees came and began to argue with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him, and he sighed deeply in his spirit and said, why does this generation seek a sign? Now, both in Mark chapter 7 and in Mark chapter 8, the Greek word that, that's used for sighing is, is connected to the same word that Paul uses in Romans chapter 8 to talk about the creation groaning. That the creation is, is exasperated. It's, it's aching and longing for something better, something different, something new. I think one of the things that happens is that the Lord Jesus enters our world and he groans with us. He groans with a creaking, aching, bewildered, perplexed universe. He, he, he meets hard-heartedness, he meets sin and destruction. And a bit like it is when he comes to Lazarus's tomb, you know, that, that he approaches Lazarus' tomb and sighs again in a way that is just expressing anger and outrage that this is the way the world is. It was not how God made the world to be. 
And you see in, in, in Mark chapter 7, you get this at the, end of, uh, at the end of the healing episode, you get this amazing little phrase, uh, Mark chapter 7 again. Uh, after Jesus heals him, uh, he says, be opened. His eyes were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. Jesus charged them to tell no one, but the more he charged them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. And they were astonished beyond measure, saying, he has done all things well. Many commentators point out that little phrase is an echo of Genesis chapter 1. God looked and saw that it was good. What, what Jesus is doing is profoundly beautiful, isn't it? Entering a broken world, groaning at its brokenness, and yet beginning to put it back to the way it was meant to be. He, he recreates this man, remakes him. And the people say what God himself said at the beginning when he saw what he had done. And I think the message of Ecclesiastes is that the groaning in our lives is very, very, very real. And it is a groaning that the Lord Jesus himself saw. And he has the power to put things back to the beginning. But the message of Ecclesiastes is, is not yet. Not yet. We've seen signs of it in his ministry. The, 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 the kingdom has broken in, but all things are not yet well. All things are not yet restored. So I think that's a, a key way to read the phrase under the sun. It, it's a way of simply describing where we are at this point in history. And here's the final one, uh, a vital word, uh, the most important thing I think to see here. I, I think this is where many of us have gone wrong over the years, very understandably by, particularly if you're reading the NIV, you have meaningless, uh, meaninglessness in Ecclesiastes. And many people think that, of course, that's just the message of the book, that all things are meaningless. The problem, of course, with that is that in the book of Ecclesiastes itself, it keeps saying some things are better than other things. Chapter 4, verse 4, better is a handful of quietness than two hands full, two hands full of toil and a striving after the wing. Things cannot be meaningless if this course of action is better than that course of action. Uh, the, the commentator that helped me most with this is Ian Proven. Uh, he has a, a commentary series, um, he, he, his commentary on Ecclesiastes is, is in a, a commentary series, the NIV application commentary series, I think it's called Zondervan, uh, produce it. And Proven and others point out that throughout the Old Testament, the word he hevel that is translated vanity or meaning, meaninglessness, meaning, meaningless, that word is also translated in other places, breath or breeze or mist or vapor. And so you get this very clearly in other places that the, the meaning is a metaphor pointing to things that are insubstantial and fleeting rather than pointing to actions that have no purpose or that are in vain. Okay, so if you, it's worth just looking at this. Look at, look at uh, Psalm 144. Psalm 144, verse 3. Lord, what is man that you regard him, or the son of man that you think of him? Man is like a breath, Hevel. His days are like a passing shadow. Now, I think, I, I'm not sure that the word Hevel in Ecclesiastes all, always means exactly that. But in many, many cases it does. And I think if you begin to read the book of Ecclesiastes with the idea that the meaning of the word vanity or meaningless is breath, shadow, mist, vapor. It puts a very different perspective on the book. I think it means that the teacher of Ecclesiastes is nearly always pointing out simply how life seems to come and go in the blink of an eye. That's what it's like. He's exploring what it feels like to recognize that life is like that. What, what does it feel like when you look at the beauty of the world and the brokenness of the world and you realize you will be here and gone tomorrow? That's what Ecclesiastes is meditating on. That he, 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 the, the writer is musing very deeply and disturbingly. He's musing on life's repetitiveness, life's brevity, life's elusiveness, the quickness of things to slip through our fingers. And all of it he's doing in the light of an eternity that belongs to a God who will judge the living and the dead. That, that's what the book is doing. The book of Ecclesiastes is a meditation on what it means for our lives to be like a whisper spoken in the wind. Hear one minute 
and carried away forever the next. So read Ecclesiastes. I hope that helps in some measure. A unified book, a stark question, a key phrase, and a vital word. And all of these things in different ways we're going to come back to uh, in the rest of the book a little bit more detail. Let me uh, finish really quickly with four Ps from the book. My, my daughter always says when I'm preaching, she says, Dad, why do you always say, and so to finish, and then do another 20 minutes? Um, <laughs> It's hope, isn't it? You have to give people hope. Um, so Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 9. Let me prove you I can do it by half 10. Um, let me just read, read the, the epilogue. We've had the prologue read to us. Chapter 12, verse 9. Besides being wise, the preacher also taught the people knowledge, weighing and studying and arranging many proverbs with great care. The preacher sought to find words of delight and uprightly he wrote words of truth. The words of the wise are like goads and like nails firmly fixed are the collected sayings. They are given by one shepherd. My son, beware of anything beyond these. Of making many books there is no end. And much study is a weariness of the flesh. The end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment. With every secret thing, whether good or or evil. If you want to know what the melodic line of Ecclesiastes is, it's laid out for you here in the epilogue. Don't, don't try and read the book or interpret the book or understand the book without getting to the end and then rereading it with the four lenses that you get here at the end. I think there are four, four Ps. The teacher says that his book has brought pleasure, verse 10. The preacher sought to find words of delight and uprightly he wrote words of truth. In our circles, we're often very strong on truth, aren't we? Rightly so. Without realizing that God has given us parts of the Bible that blend truth, truth and beauty together in profoundly wonderful ways. So the opening poetry of chapter one is incredibly beautiful. We'll look at it a little bit more tomorrow morning. And yet the punch of the poetry is, is built into the fact that it is so beautiful. Chapter 12, the, the, the words about old age and dying, you, you could simply say, getting old is awful. But to actually have poetry, chapter 12, in the day when the keepers of the house tremble and the strong men are bent and the grinders cease because they are few. I think this is a picture of old age being like, like a, a wonderful country house now falling into disrepair. It's what we feel like, don't we, the body beginning to ache. Everything's still there, but just not working the way that it used to. That's what the poetry is doing. It's, it's words of truth that are also pleasurable. They're meant to make you smile. And the wisdom literature, you're not reading the wisdom literature rightly if you're not laughing out loud at certain points, or you're not coming downstairs to your wife and kids saying, you won't believe what I found in the Bible. This is, this is amazing. Proverbs are like that. Song of Songs is like that. God could have just simply said, this is what marriage is. Ephesians 5 Genesis, uh, opening chapters of the Bible. But no, you get words of pleasure, the song of songs, a, a love song about what it's like to be in love is there in the Bible. Not just pleasure, but also pain. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter seven, verse one. A good name is better than precious ointment and the day of death better than the day of birth. Can you believe that? Can you believe that's in the Bible? The day of death is better than the day of birth. And what the teacher's doing there is chapter 12, verse 11, the words of the wise are like goads, like, like nails firmly fixed. So the sheep drivers that had sharp sticks, points in them, so you, you poke the sheep and the, the cow in this direction. Going off to the left, you get sharp pain. Go off to the right, you get sharp pain because the, the sheep driver, the shepherd, he knows the direction that you need to go in. He knows that you need to go straight. And without pain from the Bible, you and I wander off to the left or the right, don't we, all the time. This book in Ecclesiastes is a sharp tack. It's a nail, it's a knife, it's, it's a wound from behind. Friends, the day of death is better than the day of birth. You'll have to come back again to hear why or how that is. Uh, and perspective as well, the third P. The end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty 
of man. There is nothing you will do today leaving here that is not part of fearing God and keeping his commandments. If you want to know what it means to live well in the world, fear God, keep his commandments, that is the perspective that you need on life. Augustine said, love God and do what you please. And then finally, preparation. This is a huge one we're going to come back to. The book of Ecclesiastes is there to prepare us for the end. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. The, the, the fact that we need to prepare for judgment is why Ecclesiastes is not a negative book. It's why it's not an anti-Christian book. There is immense comfort in the fact that one day God will right every wrong. God will put the universe back together again the way it was always meant to be. Everything will come to judgment. So four Ps, pleasure, pain, perspective, and preparation. Let me pray, and then we can head to what we're doing next. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for how you have given us your word in so many different forms. And together we want to acknowledge that this book is perplexing to us on many levels. It's so different from what we often read or think about. We thank you for how it simply this morning stretches our minds and enlarges our hearts about who you are. We want to pause and simply acknowledge you as the creator, the good creator who made a beautiful world for us, your children, to live in. We acknowledge afresh our role in it as vandals, taking the garden and trashing what you have given. Yet we thank you that the beauty remains. We thank you, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, that you entered this world that we ruined and you came to remake it and to remake us. Thank you that this morning you stand alongside us as well as over us. We bring you together our secret sorrows, the groanings of this life, and ask that you would hold and keep us until we see you face to face. So hear us, we ask, in your precious name we pray. Amen. I do want to thank David very much indeed on behalf of us all for uh, what has already proved enormously illuminating. I think my right hand's almost aching from the notes that I've been writing down during that and already is helping us to understand this book that God has given us. David, thank you so much. Um, we're going to uh, uh, stop there. David's going to be around uh, afterwards for a few minutes. If you have any questions, you'd like to ask him just one-to-one -one, um, and uh, the Bible reading will begin uh, the next meeting at 11.15 over in the main tent. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Thank you.